that might be a warning for watching your conversation over breakfast. So, you know. <laughs> so uh, we're here from uh, Smart History. Smart History is a um, award-winning website. It's an open educational resource for the study of art history. We have about oh, almost 500 videos on art history and more than 200 essays, about 60 art historians who contribute, won a bunch of awards. We won a Webby Award. We just won the um, Open Courseware Award for Excellence this year and Time Magazine 50 Best Websites. We're art historians. We're not supposed to have any attention like this. It's right. A... It's, it's all very weird. <laughs> Um, so what you're looking at on the screen is smart history the way it looks today, but it didn't always look like that. So we're going to walk you through some of the earlier iterations and get a sense of what our prototyping looked like over the last seven years. It was about seven or eight years ago that we started smart history, actually right about the time that Sal Khan started to make math videos on YouTube for his cousin. So we joined Khan Academy, by the way, about a year ago. So we're at this fantastic conference with these really inspiring speakers doing this really important work. And we're talking about OERs. We're talking about a lot of media. And I think because media is has been sort of reimagined um, in the last few years, we forget that the visual image is so longstanding and has such an incredible tradition and is so important for us and our students to navigate the world that we live in, to look critically at images. And and so we really think that the, the student um, benefits from having, in a sense, the methodologies of our discipline. Right, so, so images are everywhere in a way that is true like no other moment in history. Yeah. And art historians over the years have developed tools for thinking about how images mean things, how to look at images critically. So we wanted to think about how to bring the tools of, of art history to our students in a more accessible way. You know, I think it's hard to remember or imagine that there was a time that images were not accessible, that in fact, there were people who went their entire lives without seeing images. Can you in, imagine? Such in the a medieval thing? era, there might have been some images in a church, in a town that was some distance from where you lived, and you might not have ever traveled to that. The idea of images being incredibly rare, I think, is, is incredibly important for us to remember when we think about what images mean now. And so the image that you're looking at actually is of uh, Andre Malraux, an art historian who wrote an essay called The Museum Without Walls. And what he was thinking about was, you know, what does it mean to look at images in a time in history when they're so easily reproducible, they're ubiquitous when we see them in so many different contexts, and how this was such a different moment in human history and our relationship with images. The problem is, in a sense, our discipline, <clears throat> art history, we have mystified the image. We have, um, in a sense, taken our cues from the power structures for which art has so often been created. Right, you and know this is true, right? When you've walked into a museum, you walk up those steps, or you listen to the English accent of the curator on the audio guide. We have nothing right? against English accents. No, but it can be a little intimidating. Well, I think. I think for our students who are often first generation. For me. That's right. Oh, and Beth and I, we, we teach in a, a community college. And for many of our students, this is their first, the first college experience in their families. Museums were alien places. Museum, the very architecture of a museum is the architecture of a palace, uh, the architecture of a temple. These are sacred spaces. These are, these are places only for the initiate. Right. And actually, I used to bring my students to Museum of Modern Art. And when we got there, and there were lines around the corner waiting to get in, the, the students would look at me and say, there are all these people who want to go see art? Like, yeah, it's really a, a great thing. Voluntarily. They, yeah, they did, right, exactly. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't think about it as a place that was for them. And um, so we were, we were teaching at a community college. These are students who uh, had to take art history. It was a required course. So uh, business majors, design majors, really didn't see any reason why they were being asked to take art history. So we really felt like it was our job to sort of convince them of the value of this and to bring them in and to make it feel fun and entertaining and accessible. And to empower them to be able to navigate their visual world. So that's really why we started Smart History. It's the undoing of that facade that you're looking at of the museum in Berlin. Munich. Munich, sorry. Um, so we started Smart History. We started Smart History 
Um, we were inspired by something called Art Mobs. A professor, this is really the, the very early days of podcasting. A professor took his students to MoMA and made some sort of renegade audio guides. And you know, this was the first time that you could make alternative audio guides. Before, the only thing you could get was you know, the museum's official voice. And we thought, you know, we could do this, and we could do this for our students. We know what they need. We know what will excite them. So we took a $30 microphone that we plugged into the top of my iPod. Um, and this is like seven and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. And we just stood and we had conversations about works of our unscripted conversations. We had a whole lot of fun. We edited them and we put them up on a blog and we put them in iTunes. We made a little map thinking people would download it. And you see go. that in the upper right corner? Yeah. Um, no one ever listened. We don't think so. <laughs> no one downloaded the map. I can basically, I mean, maybe my daughter, who's actually, I think, also still my only review for my book on Amazon.com. Um, so, but we, one of the things that we did was we put the audios and we started to make some very simple videos into our online courses and also offered our students in our face-to-face -face courses the opportunity to watch them for homework or for study. This was a really iterative process. We put it out there and we listened and found out what happened. You know, this is really the prototyping and we really learned along the way. The total investment at this point was $30 for the microphone and our time. Right, right? so our first blog was Blogger and then we went to WordPress. That was, that was a big upgrade. And we did this purposefully, <laughs> first of all, because we had no idea what we were doing, but also because- We really had no idea. But we also doing. because we wanted, we thought that maybe we were onto something and that other professors could do this as well. And we wanted to make sure that the barrier was really low. So uh, we eventually had enough. So we, we were making them still by going to the museum, but we were also just sometimes sitting, honestly, in Stephen's office or my office and opening up a textbook and saying, my students have to learn this next week. Let's record a conversation. Um, and everything was going up on a blog, but eventually we had enough, so we thought, you know, we could actually put these in chronological, it could occur to us, we could put these in chronological order. And then we could sort of have a multimedia accompaniment for the textbook. And so we made another WordPress site and tweaked it a little bit and put everything in order. And the first Smart History site, which was born, which you see on the lower left there. That was thanks to Beth's husband, who, yeah. who did a great job. Um, so, through this whole process, really what happened was we learned what was important to us. I, don't th I think if you had asked us eight years ago what was important to us, we would have been, I don't know, we want to help our students. Um, but over the years, we actually honed that a little bit. Right, and so what we did is we sort of were able to identify, listening to our students and listening to other faculty that began to use what we were doing, we began to really identify what was, what was important, what was working, what was successful, what was different from what was out there. And so we we're just going to go over a few of the key co uh, concepts that we identified. One was this idea of the experiential. On the lower left, you're seeing the goddesses from the east pediment of the, of the Parthenon in Athens, in Greece, and that's the way that it's actually represented in the most popular art history textbook, which is Janssen, which I'm sure many of you had. I didn't crop it or do anything right. to it. That's this is, how they look right. with so, a caption underneath. So as if the museum didn't decontextualize things enough, right? <laughs> this, is what, this is what we have. And so, of course, a textbook has to, um, has to put an image out in, you know, it, these are scarce things. They have real estate in the book that they have to deal with. It's expensive. There are rights issues, et cetera. Um, but media can do something very different you know, um, on the web. And so we use 20 to 30 images. And we, we allow for the tourists. When we're in a church recording, we allow for the worshiper. Students see the way in which people are actually responding to this work in their world with the sounds and the, and the fashions that they recognize. Right? This is a part of their experience. And it is not something that's rarefied. It's not something that is decontextualized. It is possible than to make them excited and to make them see this as something that is accruing meaning even in their world. So, so really, this was something we just we did, and then we realized exactly. its value as we were doing it, and we could start to articulate its value. The next thing we realized that we were doing that was valuable um, was having a conversation. It turns out having a conversation is a lot more fun than listening to one person talking. The conversation's unscripted, it's informal, you don't know where it's going to go, so it's a little bit of an adventure to it's see informed. what happens. It's informed. We hope. But, um, 
And the idea was really to inspire our students. I mean, the real idea was you know, to inspire <coughs> students to go out there and have their own conversations about a work of art, to feel empowered, not to feel intimidated, that they could bring their skills of looking closely and feeling and memory and all of those things to, to looking at a work of art. We also really tried to get away from the idea that we were the be-all and end-all, that there could be a one-stop shop. This is a world of distributed knowledge, and so we really spent a good deal of time curating really terrific resources that are out there so that we can um, bring students and teachers uh, to excellent resources that are being produced by museums and libraries. So, so every Smart History page <clears throat> has a section called Check This Out Also. Um, and, and you know, the idea, again, is like rethinking the textbook for a while was what we were thinking we were doing. You know, the textbook can have lots of images. The textbook can be multimedia. The textbook can be linked. Um, I think we're, in a way, past thinking about ourselves as a textbook. We're on to the next phase. We'll see what happens with that. And we went from teaching combined, the two of us as full-time faculty, about 200 students per semester, to um, having a site that is visited almost a million times per semester now from, um, well, those, all those countries in the last month. Now, this map is a little bit off. Greenland is not our strongest. Uh, <laughs> this has to do with percentage of new users. I don't um, know why Greenland is always the new user. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> so right now, uh, if you go to Khan Academy, you can see our videos there. And there's one here on the top middle, Discuss Modern Art. We have Andy Warhol, Why is this art video? Sort of trying to address really fundamental questions that people ask about art. Um, there's also a really strong learning community talking about art on the Khan Academy site, site that I urge you to check out. Um, if you go to smarthistory.org, you can also see our videos there and also read text and have other sort of resources for art history there. And everything's also on YouTube. So we're, we're, we're promiscuous in that way. <laughs> oh, 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 we wanted to play you a short Smart History video. Just a couple, a just a minute or so. Dionysus, the god of wine, didn't like to be lonely. He was surrounded by satyrs and by menads. He loved to party. And you can't party alone. No, you can't party alone. And of course, those satyrs would become tired sometimes after they drank a bit too much. And that's exactly the subject of the Barberini fawn that we're looking at. Now, a satyr is not a human being. He may look human to us, but he's, in Greek mythology, part animal, really. That's right. He's a subhuman. The hierarchy of the gods were the gods of Mount Olympus at the top. Then you had heroes that were half divine and half human. Then you had humans, and then you had subhumans, and even below that, monsters. A satyr would be a subhuman, and if you look really closely, you can tell that although he looks quite human in most ways, he's got a tail, pointy ears, and sometimes this is even represented with hooves. Yeah, you can see the tail actually coming from behind his left thigh. That's where I first noticed it. And for the Greeks, these particular subhumans, the satyrs, were half civilized and half wild, and so it was a wonderful way to express the uncultivated, the kind of barbaric qualities of human nature. His name is the Barberini Fawn. All right, so you, you get the idea of what there's, there's almost 500 of those of us blabbing about uh, works of art. Really? And I, I just want to say, and then I'll let you say something, um, all of our technology, total $200. Right. Screenflow, so, $89, GarageBand or Audacity, really cheap, keeping our microphone is $100. No video equipment goes into the museum. It's an audio player, um, an audio recorder. The guards can't stop you from talking and recording yourself in a museum, <laughs> we've learned. Um, and, uh, and a little cheap uh, Lumix camera, not too cheap, but not an expensive camera. So really very, very minimal uh, technology. Meanwhile, we get letters every day from, uh, from professors, from students all over the world saying, you've given me access to a world that I never had access to to before. We hope very much that other people will use this kind of model, will not look for the $500,000 grant, but will look for the needs that are out there and do great work. Yeah, and, and you know, the whole, you know, we thought we were doing one thing. We thought we were going for one audience in a particular way, right? Um, 
And it turned out that the audience was bigger, right? We're reaching, te you know, teachers watch our videos. You know, the audience is different. The way we distribute things is different. A lot of things have changed from that um, moment seven years ago. But I think the core idea of, of making content that was accessible and fun for art history has remained the same. Thank you so much. Thanks. <laughs>